Let's do a speed run through the Llama 2 paper. I want to highlight some of the things that I found the most interesting. The first thing we have to remember is this model is in the context of other developments by folks like OpenAI, Anthropic, Google. What Meta's don't showing is that they're in the same ballpark as all of these. Now, the paper they dropped, this is just one in a long line of papers. There's a lot of unfinished parts, multilingual coding. This is the successor to the earlier Llama model, which was well regarded. It did well, just not great. And it was only available for research, which meant lots of commercial users couldn't take advantage of it. That's all changed with this model. I'm going to just go down the same structure that the paper is written. First thing we're going to do, Meta comes out just boom, boom, showing right away. Look at that top left diagram. We're in the same ballpark as ChatGPT. If you ask ChatGPT 100 times, we're going to win 36, 36 out of those times. And the rest of those... Lots of ties. We're not losing that much to ChatGPT. Same thing on the right side where they wanted to show compared to other open source models, we're way and above what you want for helpfulness and safety. We're not to GPT-4, but we're getting there. They demonstrate throughout this paper all the time, they're much better at safety than any of the other existing open source models and even some of the better, some of the competitor models. What they've released are two types of models. A Llama 2 base model, in different size variants. So for those of you who have different size GPUs, that works for that, as well as a chat version that has been optimized for dialogue. One of the things you should always do, I learned in law school, is read the footnotes. One thing they didn't release is the 34 billion parameter model because it didn't pass the red teaming test. That's when people attack the model, it failed, it didn't come out. But the rest of the models are out there. You can go grab them, start using them. It's going crazy for how we're doing that. So let's jump through. One of the things they do is they give us the high level architectural diagram, of how we, the, we train these models. This paper spends a ton of time on that reinforcement learning with human feedback, that human feedback component. Previously, Anthropic OpenAI used these techniques, didn't tell us very much. This paper dives a lot into it. I'm not gonna have time to talk about all the aspects. I could spend just an hour talking through everything they taught us in this. Now. These models are pre-trained. They're pre-trained with twice as much data as the Llama 1 model. This paper doesn't tell us exactly what that other data is. The rumor is that maybe they didn't want to tell us because everybody is now getting sued for that pre-trained model that was used in Llama 1, which often had books, for example, where we didn't necessarily didn't have permission to use that. So that could be one reason why they haven't told us. They have, of course, tried to exclude data. For those of you worried about censorship, they have not censored it at all. All the hate stuff is in this. They want to be able to use it. So if you want to use the model for hate speech classification, you can. If you're worried about uncensored models, the pre-trained models are a great starting point. They're also, as the evaluation shows, a little bit more toxic. Two of the architectural details that come out of this that are different are increased context length. We can get even longer context lengths in the 4K that they use by using rope scaling. And then they also use the group attention query. They spend a bunch of time in the appendix explaining it if you're not sure, right? A lot of details on hyperparameters. The big thing I want to show you is these loss curves. I'm very excited about these loss curves because if you see, they're going down, but they don't level off which means there's room to improve these models with more training. So again, this is not a final finished product. We're going to see lots of things that keep getting better. As we go through this, they even give us the hardware. So if you're curious, like, what does a GPU cost for building something like this? We know they spent over three and a half million GPU hours. You convert that to dollars. That's like eight, nine million dollars in today's costs for training that model. They even do a little bit of greenwashing here. They give you a little bit of the carbon footprint of this, which nobody in AI seems to care about um, like that. When we go and look at the model evaluations, they get two things. One, boom, they're much better than any of the other open source models. They again emphasize that. One area they don't do so good is on code. Didn't have a lot of code that it was trained in. It's not really a focus of this model. It's something I think that can be fixed in future ones. But for those of you looking for that, where ChatGPT is still going to be better in coding like that. Now, they also compare to commercial providers. And again, this is where Meta is showing, look, we're in the same ballpark as, as GPT 3.5. Our scores are right there. And that's one of the things it's clear that this model, in both the evaluation of the paper and what I've heard on the street, we're at that similar level of quality 
um, here. Not to GPT-4, but we're on our way there. Maybe some people will, you know, ensemble it up and get similar. The next piece is fine tuning. Fine tuning here is something like instruction fine tuning, where they show you some examples of, you know, hey, here's some tasks that I want you to do. Will you solve these tasks? There's lots of existing data sets for this. That's exactly kind of what they were able to use is start to use these public data sets. One of the things they found though, is you can use these models to create new instruction tasks. And this sentence down here is really important that the, one, that the tasks that come out of the model, the ones that are created by computers, work just as well as the human ones. So this is kind of where we are, where we can use the models to train the models and it works pretty good. Now, the majority of the paper spends time on this reinforcement learning with human feedback. The reason this is important is when we use these models to create and generate output, there's a variety of output they create. Some of it is helpful, some of it's not so helpful. Some of it's appropriate, some of it's not appropriate. The RLHF is a mechanism where we're gonna reward the model to act the way we want to. And have lots of details in the paper for exactly how they do that. What do they tell the annotators for doing it? This is by far the clearest, most transparent way of uh, uh, documentation for how to do it. Sure, you could add a lot more details, but this gives us a lot more understanding of it. For example, they used millions of examples of feedback in kind of doing this. So this is not a light task. They probably spent, again, millions of dollars just on this part of it to get the data annotated to do that, but to get that human feedback in the model. Now, with that result of that human feedback, they're able to get much better performance. A couple of things they note is one is the model's helpful by adding more and more data, but this is gonna to continue to scale. We could add, we could make the model even better if we took time to do it. Skipping over a lot of good stuff, but I did wanna point this one out. Let's look at some examples where they ranked at safety before we applied the RLHF tuning versus after. And you can see here the box shows these are the ones that had low safety, but got a lot better once they added RLHF. And it's just one of the, one of these examples. And I'm going to show you a couple of other data points that they showed, showing the value of of doing this to help understand it. And to make it concrete, if you're not sure like exactly what is the safety doing, they even provide a nice good example to see what happens of a response before and after with this. Um, let's keep going. Often you train models to be really helpful and then you layer on safety afterwards. And in this, what they're trying to show is, is as they were adding more and more of that safety, the overall model was still helpful. There's an enormous variety in terms of the generative output these models can do. So one important task is where people attack the model with all different types of crazy things to see how the model responds. This paper gives a little bit of insight into that, where in this case, they used 350 people to red team it. They red teamed it at various different parts of the model process. They you know, mentioned many of the risk categories that they used. Remember that 33 billion parameter model didn't get through it. This is something other companies are gonna have to start doing as you're building your own models is doing that. Couple of good nuggets in the discussion section. I really like this figure 20, which shows as they move from supervised fine tuning and started adding in steps like the reinforcement learning human feedback, what happened was that distribution changes for that reward model score. So here I think of it as the output of the results that come out are fairly distributed among all the grades, but what we really want is less C's, D's, and F's and more A's and B's. And that's what that RLHF does is it rewards the better performing outputs, teaches the model, write A and B answers, don't write D and F answers. And this visualization shows you that as the model was using that, the scores started to tend towards that. A um, Couple other insights that I thought were kind of useful in this. One is this temporal perception that the model was able to better understand kind of the concept of time, what's before and after um, through this. The model also did really well with tools. And I'm a big fan of this idea of being able to take things like calculators, search, weather APIs, use those with the models. The model out of the box did really well on that. And I know people are gonna out there fine tune these models and do even better. So that's another exciting kind of um, one for me as well. So go check out the paper. I've skipped over a ton of stuff. It's very readable and approachable.